Fires have been burning in Australia for months, destroying thousands of homes, killing more than 25 people with no sign of slowing down. You can help by donating to support firefighters and charities, aiding people and animals. We have links to these organizations and more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Australia. Coming up on Daily Tech News Show, CES 2020 is in the books. And we recap some of the highlights and get the last word on products we think are worth your attention. This is the Daily Tech News Show starting now. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, January 10th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Also in Los Angeles, I'm Lamar Wilson. And drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And uh, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We were uh, just having a discussion about uh, TV shows from The Witcher to Flirty Dancing. Uh, <laughs> we were also discussing the lyrics to Axel F. from Beverly Hills Cop. Uh, so much good stuff in Good Day Internet. you got to become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Facebook is offering test access to some users of its desktop redesign that it first announced last April. The new look is supposed to be less cluttered using brighter icons and has an optional dark mode. Test users will see a pop-up inviting them to what the company is calling the new Facebook, with an option to switch back to the old look if they choose. Facebook is also asking for feedback on the new design. Massimo Corporation, which developed signal processing technology for healthcare monitors and its spinoff, Circuit Core Laboratories, are suing Apple for improper use of trade secrets. The lawsuit claims Apple got secret information from Massimo in 2013 and used it to infringe 10 patents, including methods to measure oxygen levels in blood and heart rate using light emitters and detectors. Ooh. Uber will stop operations in Colombia at the end of this month. Late last year, a court ordered Uber to cease operations for violating competition rules. Uber says it's going to continue to fight for the rights of its drivers and riders, and it sent a letter to the government of Colombia this week saying it may sue under the free trade agreement that Colombia has with the United States. The U.S. International Trade Commission is investigating allegations of patent violations by Philips against Fitbit and Garmin. The case covers four Philips patents on functions including motion tracking and alarm reporting. India's highest court ruled Friday that a 150-day internet blackout in Indian-administered Kashmir violated Indian telecommunications law. India's government claimed the blackout was a security measure to prevent protests after a change to Kashmir's special status. However, Justice N.V. Ramana ruled that, quote, freedom of internet access is a fundamental right. The court has given the government of India a week to revise its policies and become more transparent about internet shutdown orders in the future. All right, let's start by uh, talking a little bit about Microsoft and some hot water. A former contractor working in Beijing had spoken to The Guardian about a grading program to transcribe and vet audio from Skype translations and Cortana requests, both Microsoft companies. The British contractor said that he reviewed thousands of potentially sensitive recordings on his personal laptop for two years while he was working in Beijing. The contractor also said that both usernames and passwords for other contractors were emailed to new hires in plain text and then shared between multiple contractors to make logins easier. Microsoft said says it has ended that program and moved human grading into secure facilities, none of which are in China. Microsoft also says that the snippets are a very small percentage of de-identified content and not more than 10 seconds long. Yes, a lot of this is an echo of the stories we had in 2019 about this sort of thing. Uh, you know, people's information, very small amount, but sometimes people's information being reviewed by contractors and where companies being transparent enough. Uh, the Guardian story is, is very much about this contractor saying how bad the security control of that information was by the company he was contracting to. So mm -hmm. the question becomes how responsible was Microsoft for this? Should they have been looking into this contractor more? They've done the right thing since it came to light, obviously. Uh, but, but you know, it, it, there, I, I don't know that there's much that we can learn from this or move on. It seems like the companies all know that this is not acceptable now. Yeah, I, I again, Microsoft not overseeing the day-to-day the -day operations of a, a third-party company. Well, you know, sometimes things slip through the cracks. But not knowing things like usernames and passwords and how they're shared and the fact that a bunch of passwords were being used by multiple people just to make it kind of easier to log in and the fact that this was coming from within China and even if they're 10-second snippets, 
Uh, you know, some of this is accidental audio that's picked up. Uh, you know, a lot of this can be sensitive information. You know, who had access to this information based on the way that the Internet works there and who might still have it? Yeah, I'm not as concerned about the China part as I am that they're still not monitored by by uh, Microsoft themselves. I, mean, I, I think that's the problem that these companies need to deal with is that there's just some sense of information you don't send out to third parties. I mean, you, you you know they can make their own office in in China if if that's possible. I'm, I'm just you know and they have here. Microsoft has okay. operations in China, so yeah. Yeah, so I I just see no reason why to to push that out. It's you know keep it, you know that that would make me feel better. Yeah, you know, keeping that in house. The way if the shoe drops, we know who who to blame for it. I mean, I think it's fine to give it to a third party if that third party is demonstrably trustworthy, and that's been the problem is that they contracted it out simply to save some money, it seems like, right. without yes. checking to make sure that these companies were following proper security practices. And that's not okay. Absolutely. So let's talk about Nielsen and music. So Nielsen reports that music streaming services grew 30% in the U.S. last year. That's pretty incredible. Reaching 1 trillion streams for the first time. 82% of music consumption in the United States now comes from streaming music services, including Spotify, Apple Music, and YouTube. Physical album sales fell 19% to 9% and of the market in 2019. Nielsen says Post Malone was a top act of 2019, and Drake, Billie Eilish, Taylor Swift, and Ariana Grande were numbers two through five. Genre-wise, uh, hip-hop took uh, a 28% share, rock came in at 20%, and pop was in third place with 14%. Oh, no, we might need to rename popular music if it's not that popular anymore. <laughs> right, yeah. Exactly. Now I mean, it's just, hip hop you know, is the new pop. Yeah. Yeah. You probably never heard of this pop song. Very indie. <laughs> I think I, I you know, <laughs> the streaming services growing uh, does not surprise me. Growing 30 percent last year is a big bump. That's a big that, jump. You know, that's a that's a lot of adoption happening uh, in the U.S. at least in 2019. I think a lot of that has to do with, especially mobile carriers, sometimes bundling this into their deals. I know my um, my most recent Verizon plan ended up giving me Apple Music if I chose a certain Same. tier. So I didn't have to pay for it separately. I was like, great, yeah. awesome. I'll save $10 a month type thing. And and I just, uh, you know, just more folks having uh, the bandwidth to be able to, to enjoy the stuff. And Man, physical album sales falling down to nine percent. You know, we've heard so much talk about, well, you know, the hipsters and DJs are keeping vinyl alive. Not that people still aren't buying that, but it does seem like it is. We're get we're getting to the end of life here. Yeah, and the, and the majority of that physical decline is CDs. Uh, CDs are now just an inconvenient way to get digital music, right? They, I the the last time I got a CD was from a Kickstarter I had backed, and I knew I was going to get the CD. It wasn't like it was a surprise. But once I got it, I was like, wait, what do I do with this? Because I also <laughs> had the MP3s from that <laughs> Kickstarter, right? So I'm like. I don't have a convenient way to rip this. I don't need to rip it because I got the MP3s. Like, I'm not sure what I'm doing with a CD. And I think 82% uh, of music consumption being streaming, I think that's where the everyone, you could you could literally round that up to everyone and the 18% can complain, but most everyone is just streaming their music now. Isn't that here. a weird thing, Tom, that, that I mean, you and, and I, and I mean, probably most of us here are, are like, what do we do with this thing? Like, like just for what a CD is, you know, if I get something from Nintendo, like the best, you know, their music compilations, I'm like, that's great, but I have nowhere to, yeah. <laughs> where, do I, where do I play this? And, and I have it's, an it's LP crazy how player changed. in my front room. If I get a vinyl yeah. copy of something, I know exactly what to do with it, right? <laughs> that's so funny. Yeah. But, uh, uh, well, and uh, congratulations to Drake, Billie Eilish, <laughs> and Ariana Grande. Yes, they're not doing uh, things. Oh, and, and, Post and, Malone, and of course, Post Malone, who it, we had a we had a story on streaming numbers from Spotify. Gosh, last month I think Post Malone was their number one artist. So looks like he's uh, he's he's a crowd favorite. Yeah, and I, I, hopefully, I, hopefully they're making money. Yeah, I've been streaming more music. Uh, like I just use Apple Music through the Amazon Echo and just have it play today's hits. Uh, yeah. Quite often, so you know, I oh, think a lot a of thing? this who is the uh, five years ago, uh, there were people who were like, "Yeah, but streaming, you don't really own the music. What if the album gets yanked for some reason from the service that you use, and and you know, you you really aren't in control of that." That does sometimes happen, but less and less frequently. Yeah, streaming so streaming music is is has has gotten pretty solid to the point where it is a rare day where I go, "Where's this album on Apple Music that I wanted and and doesn't exist anymore?" Now we need, just need to do TV, and we're good. 
Right. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> 10 Speed yeah. and Brown Shoe Pilot is available for streaming. Well, no, we're there. Researchers at Malwarebytes say that an Android phone subsidized by the U.S. government for low income users comes pre installed with software that installs adware without the user's knowledge or permission. Software is located in the settings app, meaning you could uninstall it, but then you'd be uninstalling the settings app, which means you wouldn't be able to use your phone. So not really a way to uninstall it. A second piece of software called Wireless Update installs your phone's security and system updates, but also other apps without permission. It appears to be a variant of a, uh, ad ops from a Chinese company that was found to collect user data on blue phones. So that's uh, worrying. And again, if you could remove it, but if you do, you won't get any system and security updates anymore. Uh, the $35 phone is called the UMX U686CL. You get it through Virgin Mobile's Assurance Wireless Program. It's part of the Lifeline Assistance Program, which is a US FCC plan to make free or government subsidized phone service available to millions of low-income families. Sprint is investigating this uh, because Sprint owns Virgin Mobile, but said it did not believe the apps were malicious. And Malwarebytes didn't find any actual malware being installed by these two apps, although Malwarebytes considers the two apps themselves to be malware. They, they haven't been installing anything malicious. Uh, but I, I don't think that's the point. It's not whether this is malicious. It's that you just because I'm getting it. a subsidized phone, Lamar, you pointed this out in our prep meeting, doesn't mean yeah. I should give up these rights. Yeah, exactly. That's what's baffling. I know people who have the, who have these type of phones uh, who are low income, and if the government is already subsidizing it, why? What? What is the? What's the point of the ads? You know, and, and I just that's just that's just greed at that point. I mean, you the know, point of ads is more money on top yeah, of that yeah, subsidized. Yeah, phone. but yeah, you're right. Just, this phone is already subsidized. It, it yeah, government it is paying for it. <laughs> have to have the ads on top of right. it. Right. Right. That's my only thing. Yeah, the the whole thing of like, well, you could technically uninstall this, you know, the, the, these apps that you might not um, you might not want, you know, adware and, and just kind of bloatware, even if it's not malicious, like you mentioned, Tom, <laughs> for the phone to then become useless at that That's point. That's just insulting. Yeah, it is. It, it is. is. Yeah, and this yeah, the subsidized model should have absolutely nothing to do with this. This is actually a great program on the surface. It's a yeah. fantastic got, program. I mean, yeah. let, let's be clear. We're not saying this phone's this phone isn't free. You have to pay thirty five dollars for it, and Sprint is getting money from the government to make up the difference. So putting the ads on top of it, if that wasn't clear, it's not like we're saying, oh, nothing is free. No, 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 no. This this phone should have already been paid for. And then they're putting ads on top of it, which don't give you any control, which no one would accept that from a website under California law or European law. Absolutely. That's ridiculous. Yeah. So yeah, this is this is not okay. According to a Pew Research Center survey conducted June 3rd through 17th of 2019, one in five U.S. adults now say they regularly wear a smartwatch or a fitness tracker. Among households that earn more than $75,000 per year, 31% wear one on a regular basis, compared with 12% of households with annual income below $30,000. Gender-wise, 25% of women say that they regularly use wearables compared to 18% of men. So women are wearing more of them. Hispanic and black adults more likely than Caucasian adults to wear a fitness tracker. 26%, 23%, excuse me, and 20% respectively. What to do with that data? More a matter of dispute. For, ex for example... <laughs> The story has really gotten to my heart. <laughs> Whether it's acceptable to share health data from wearables with heart disease researchers, 41% said yes, 35% said unacceptable, 22% weren't sure. Yeah, so this is uh, this is an interesting breakdown, I, and and there's all kinds of of speculation you could have about why it breaks down this way. Uh, it, you know, is it that uh, women wear wearables more often because? They're more concerned with health, or is it more concerned with weight loss? Is is it just uh, is it just a random uh, situation? I don't know. Yeah, that's a it, it, that uh, stat was interesting to me because, you know, I would never say, well, women care more about fitness than men because that's not true. It depends on the person, of course, and these statistics are you know they they apply to everybody you know for different reasons. I think maybe. Um, it might have to do with the fact that, you know, it's kind of a, 
in, in a way, like a piece of jewelry. Oh, um, yeah. Maybe, Which, maybe women are a little bit more watch wearing than men in general. You know, I don't know if that's true, but that would be more maybe my bracelet guess. wearing probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah perhaps. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. And, and men generally wear, uh, again, we're, we're verging on lots of stereotypes. So, you know, forgive us, but you know, men in general will, will wear, if they wear watches, a lot of times it's wearing them for status symbols. Right. Uh, and, and a Fitbit isn't as much of a status symbol as a tie, you know, as a Rolex. Excuse you, Tom Merritt. This is, you know, this is getting me into the Unless club. you're Sarah Lane. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, I'm I'm glad to be in the black men that uh that 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 small percentage that has uh <laughs> the Apple Watch. Not the sensible status. middle percentage there. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Now, did we mention in the pre-show? Was was it was it the Hispanic and black was? I think you mentioned Sarah because they were younger. It was like a younger demographic. No, Roger, and, Roger mentioned well, Roger, that, Roger, that Roger, Roger, uh, Hispanic yeah. and 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 black population do tend to be a little younger. And this study did find that amongst younger users, there was higher adoption. So that that might affect those numbers. Yeah, it's really interesting breakdown. Uh, it, it it's also interesting to me, just in a meta sense, that we're ha we have enough people wearing uh, these devices now to do a meta study like this. You know, thirty one percent of uh, people uh, making $75,000 or more wear them, even 12% uh, of people with annual income below 30,000 uh, wearing one. That tells me that, you know, it's not mass. It's not like everybody you meet is going to have a uh, wearable, but it's certainly more than it used to be where it was perceived as like, well, you must be just a real enthusiast about something to right. wear this. It's becoming a little yeah. more mainstream. Well, and, and again, going back five years and a little bit more, the whole kind of wearable fitness tracker the market was still testing the waters. And there were a lot of people who were just like, I'm not gonna wear that. I don't care how many steps I take in a day. But the smartwatch has blossomed into so much more than that, you know, an extension of your smartphone, giving you all sorts of data. Um, and fitness trackers, even you know, I'm wearing the Fitbit Versa too, it is very fitness oriented, but it gives me a lot of other information that has has made it more, uh, it, is, it is a source of information for me, not just an exercise tool, although it is that as well. Yeah, I I went from not really wanting to wear the Apple Watch when it first came out. I uh, wore it for like a month, and then uh, we ended up giving, a, giving it away at Nerdtacular uh, to uh, trying it again a couple of years later, and now I'm hooked. I, I love the mostly the fitness stuff, but as a side benefit, the notifications, you mm -hmm. know, the weather. Uh, I don't use it as much to control things. Like I'll have my podcast player controls on there, but that seems a little finicky sometimes. Uh, but, but yeah, I am, uh, I suppose I'm one of those unusual white men that wear a wearable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. I, I use mine for this really, this really interesting. This is like the, is the latest one of series five. Mm -hmm. I believe. Or, yeah. So I, I, I found this great use for this. It's called, uh, time where you can find out how much, you know, what, what time it is during the day. And I, I find that very fascinating for this, this device. You know, I should try that. Yeah. Is that an app? It, it's it's actually built in, and most people don't see it. it uh, it's amazing. I don't like yeah. bloatware on my watch. Oh, yeah, I don't, I, maybe you can uninstall it then. But I mean, we joke, but at the same time, for many years, I didn't wear a watch because I was like, I always have my iPhone with me. Like, how hard, is, how hard is it? And even when I started to wear my Fitbit, it took a solid month for me to stop reaching for my phone wherever my phone was in my pocket or a purse or at the table mm -hmm. next to me and finally i've i've now finally gotten to the point where i'm like the time is a part of me it's 148 <laughs> p.m pacific and that's like it's it's going backwards a little bit but it has been really nice to yeah. retrain myself to to wear it, a watch it sounds silly but it, it, you're right labar it's it it is one of the major benefits of, of wearing a watch you know watch wearers already knew this but when now we're part of yeah it. yeah we're <laughs> part of one of you one of you Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. Engadget handed out its official Best of CES awards. They are the CTA partner on this. Uh, the Best of CES went to Hydra Loop. Remember me mentioning on, on the show earlier this week mm -hmm. that we didn't talk about water recycling enough. Here's our chance. Hydra Loop is a home water purification device that you install, and it will take your wastewater, filter it six ways, and then reroute it for use in your toilets, your washing machine, 
If you have a pool, it can water your your lawn with it. Uh, it's available in Europe already and coming to the United States this year for $4,000. Among the other winners uh, were the Phonak Verto Black Hearing Aid with Bluetooth, just a very good implementation of that. Uh, the Withings Scan Watch, we talked about this on the show, that has the heart rate sensor, the ECG, and 30-day battery life and a that very good-looking nice. analog yeah. kind of mm-hmm. appearance. Uh, the Wallbox Quasar, uh, which manages an electric vehicle's battery to help power your home. So you keep your, your car charged, but then you can actually supplement the power in your home from your car's battery. It kind of manages that for you. Uh, we talked about the Weber Connect Smart Grilling Hub, usable with any grill. That won one of the uh, category awards. And the Razer Kishi, side controllers for your phone, also won the Engadget People's Choice Award. Uh, the Verge gave its own best in show mm. award to the Lenovo ThinkPad X1 Fold and called out the Alienware Concept UFO, Intel's NUC9 Extreme Platform, Form, Samsung's bezel-less 8K screen, uh, the GEC smart switches, smart switches and dimmers, the hubless ones. We talked about all those on the show, and and they gave an award to the Netgear Nighthawk Mesh. Uh, oh, we good. talked about yeah. all of these on the shows. Uh, so well, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the trends we saw here. But Lamar, I know you've been following this really closely too. What what has caught your eye out of the CES to kind of help us wrap this up? I mean, it's got so much stuff. So I. I I, I am I lean towards gaming because that's kind of what I do the most. But uh, the the what was it called the the big O from Origin? Uh, mm-hmm. They had a PC that is a gaming streaming PC, but you can also choose to have it uh, installed PS4 Pro or Xbox Digital Edition installed in the case. Which I, I think is like really cool. Now that's crazy expensive, but for someone who's so a it's streamer, the hardware from the it's PS. actual hardware. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not not the not the console, <laughs> not, wow. not the box. Yeah, they take the board out and everything. I guess they got hmm. permission to do that, and it's just it looks beautiful. It's a it's a great concept, and again, uh, is one of those you know the new ones are coming out at the end of the year. You know how how uh, you know how how long term. But I think if you're an enthusiast, they, 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 I thought that was like really cool to see uh, on there. That takes me back to the old ultimate gaming machine or Uggum uh, that we built on the screensavers way back in the day, which was like a Frankenstein. Oh, the Uggum. Stuff to the game. Uh, yeah, I yeah. wasn't even born then. Wow. When was that? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was before, before you, you were born. <laughs> exactly. Um, um, so also Samsung um, showed it, showed off a um, the Odyssey G9, which is like it's 49 inch ultra wide gaming monitor, which I, I need. I need it. Yeah. I don't, it's not a want. I need it. Yeah, because I need this I have, for my setup here too. <laughs> yeah, I have two twenty-seven inch dual monitors, and now I want this to replace it. It, it is. I keep it's saying I'm going to get a new monitor, and I keep sticking with my old HP twenty-seven inch. Like I really <laughs> need to do it. But every time oh, yeah, we I, talked about that, yeah, I yeah. see the sticker price on these things, and I just get eh, I don't know. Yeah, and then the. Um, Oh yeah, we you, you talked about the the concept uh, UFO from Alienware. Yeah, we it's, talked about that, that a little bit on Tuesday with Sherlock. Yeah. Love, yeah. Yeah, so it's a handheld. Uh, it looks like a switch, you know. Did it, you it's like it? Do you, you like this concept? I like. I really do like the concept. I mean, yeah, the 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 switch is kind of like you know, I'll say the pioneer, but like what is the popular thing now? But something for Windows that can play Windows games. I mean, we, we're, I'm always looking for an X, a portable Xbox. I think that'll be the dream. And mm-hmm. and so something like that is at least heading to that direction. The, the switch is crazy popular, right? You know, so people and mobile games are popular. People do want. You know this stuff on the, on the go. I feel uh, like I this, caught, can this one. caught a lot of people's imagination because if you like the Switch and you're like, oh, but I could play all these games that I can't play on the Switch yeah. in a similar fashion <laughs> with a little bigger screen, like yeah, I think that that started to get some wheels turning. Exactly. And and, and finally, just a little fun thing that happened at the beginning of the week: the uh, the PlayStation Five logo uh, reveal was funny. I was watching the conference and I felt bad for my fellow uh, comrades who. Who who do videos and or blogs whatever who was sitting there with the record button just just waiting for that moment for the reveal that everybody thought uh, there was no reveal and I I I, I felt bad well, for people I, there I was want to do a video. reveal it was like well, the old logo but with a five <laughs> yes so um, that was a, that was a sad afternoon <laughs> or yeah you know people I, were just I, I waiting see for that take on it uh, that, that you you sent us the link to uh, where they just like it was it was kind of a weird <laughs> yeah. flex by Sony to just be like here's our new logo guess what it's the same as the old logo drop I the drop. mic <laughs> <laughs> there you go Mark Sarah see that has a column about that we'll have the link in the show notes now, as well. let, me, let me ask you just you what what do you like I didn't see everything on CES I was busy here but like 
was it a better show than the year before? Or, you I, know, I gotta what? say, I you know there are, I've been to so many CES shows. <laughs> right. uh, they sometimes blend together, and there's it, it's very easy, especially for people who are reporting on it all the time. We kind of go like, oh, we gotta trudge back to Vegas, and there's gonna be all this vaporware that never sees the light of day, and concept cars that aren't real, and you know it's everyone kind of jokes about that part of it, and that was true this year. But I also saw a lot of just really practical technology. And that's not, you know, yeah. I, I'm a sucker for the big AK TV that I don't need and I'm not going to buy anytime soon, but I still like that. You know, I like the flashy stuff. But really, a lot of the home automation, uh, smart IoT devices, things to help you sleep better, you know, stuff where it's like they didn't really have to sell me that hard on the idea, you know, as long as the product works as advertised. Yeah. I thought that there was, I was kind of impressed. I felt like, CES came down to earth a little bit more this year for me. I heard more people Good saying, point. wow, I found more things that I thought were interesting than usual, which the the general, you know, jaded tech press is like, eh, it's another CES full of vaporware, right? So there really was a feeling of there's some interesting stuff. There's also the weird stuff, but there's some interesting stuff. Uh, I, I We saw smaller TVs being touted, the 48-inch TVs with the OLED panel from LG Display, along That's with the big cool. ones. I thought that yeah. was an interesting trend to be putting a smaller TV as an advantage, right? Uh, we saw a lot of foldable screens in concept devices rather than last year when the foldable screen was the concept. They're like, look, we can fold a screen. This year they were like, now that we can fold a screen, here's what we might do with it. Uh, Hubless smart home tech that, like you said, Sarah, the rising tide of health-oriented tech, uh, wide use and misuse of AI and things, though I think with true machine learning uh, now showing up in products, we saw a lot of products that, can make promised automation features, things that they say they could do but didn't really do well, start to work well. So I, I, I think broadly, uh, that's 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 where I came out of CES. I agree. It was it was a better show for practicality than usual. A lot of good CES stories in our subreddit as well. Thanks for, to everybody who submits stories and votes on others so they will rise to the top. DailyTechNewsShow.reddit.com. You can also join in the conversation in our Discord, and you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. All right, let's check in with Chris Christensen. It's 2020, and the Amateur Traveler has a little news bit about Airbnb's recent milestone. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. You're familiar, I would assume, with Airbnb, which has been disrupting the hotel world as well as the online booking world. One story I missed, but I saw on skift.com that in 2019, Airbnb actually passed up Expedia in the number of room nights booked. And so that's a fairly significant disruption in that industry. Expedia had been for some time the largest booking engine on the planet. And what that does to the future of the accommodation industry is unclear, especially as Airbnb is planning to expand their offerings to be more of a full service offering than they are today. They've already added to accommodations tours, and we'll see what else they add. I'm Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Interesting moment. Thank you, Chris. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Yeah, Doug had some thoughts on vehicle pedestrian alerts. We talked about this on the show yesterday. Uh, Doug says, your coverage when you talked about vehicle to pedestrian alerts and how they would work with vehicles, I work in the automotive electrical area and thought I'd give you some insights. Actually, it was on our Wednesday show. One of the reasons this technology is starting to come out, Doug says, is there are there seems to be an agreement to move to a 5G-based vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to pedestrian communication system. For years, there was a competing standard called DSRC that was a form of Wi-Fi, and it caused confusion about what would be deployed. One of the arguments for going to a 5G system was that an added benefit would be easier adoption with pedestrians and cyclists, as their phones would automatically be carrying the proper radios. As far as interaction goes, while phones will undoubtedly alert users to a threat of a major part of the system, will be added uh, temporospatial awareness by the vehicle of who is around it, and if necessary, early triggering of autonomous emergency braking on the vehicle in order to slow or stop it. Yeah, that's a big one. Being able to automatically slow down a vehicle or stop it uh, to avoid hitting a pedestrian is right. is, is a, a way bigger part of this equation than the pedestrian necessarily knowing to get out of the way. Doug's re Doug, thank you for sharing your expertise. I love this email. We, we need that in L.A. ASAP. <laughs> Oh yeah, so oh, many. Man. I, yeah. I'm like, put that in my car. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> yeah. if if I'm in danger of hitting anything at all, I mean, just stop my car if for yes. any reason I'm not I, able to do so. I agree. 
Shout out to all our patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Tim Ashman, Philip Shane, and Jeffrey Zilks. All right, let's check in with Len Peralta, who has been busily drawing uh, the topics of the show today. Len, what have you got? Well, you know, uh, this image is called <laughs> Lamar Wilson's Wild CES Ride. And I know that Lamar did not actually make it to CES. He actually stayed back. But this is what That's I feel. That's why he's so happy. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and very, very happy in this image. Uh, Yeah, this is what it would, I think it would look like in, in Lamar's head about all the things he was so excited about. Foldable tech, switch-like things, big honking screens, and of course, logo-only tech of the PS5. Uh, <laughs> you logo. nailed it. You nailed it. And I did have a press badge. I just didn't show up. So, yeah. That is, that's yeah, right. So it's all yeah. true. All, all of, <laughs> it's it's, all it's what is going on inside of Lamar's head. So, uh, yeah, you can. Uh, this is available right now at my online store, lenperaltastore.com. Or if you're a Patreon member uh, of mine at uh, patreon.com forward slash len, you can get this uh, right now. It's up there right now. Download it. Print it out. Make it your own. So You even nailed the shirt and the sweatpants. You are amazing. <laughs> so that, is, that is exactly I do, what I... Hey man, I do my, I do my research for my for the guests, so there you go. So. <laughs> Thank you, Len. Also, thanks to Lamar Wilson for being with us today. Lamar, what has been going on in your world? Hey, start of the new year, uh, got some cool things coming on a YouTube channel, uh, YouTube.com/slash Lamar Wilson. In one hour exactly, I will be dropping a video about uh, me buying the PS2 on eBay and uh, getting scammed. So, oh, so really. Interesting video. So uh, check that out on my channel in one hour from now. Oh, man, I'm sorry to hear that, but I'm dying to find out what the yeah, story yeah. is. So I can't yeah, wait it's, to... a, it's an interesting story. <laughs> uh, folks, don't forget we have new Patreon reward merchandise to celebrate six years of DTNS. Len Peralta created a six-year anniversary DTNS logo. You can get it on a mug, a T-shirt, a poster, a sticker. Uh, you just have to support us at a qualifying level on Patreon for three months. Uh, so if you're already supporting us at one of these levels, uh, just hang around for three months and you'll get one of these. All the details are available at patreon.com slash DTNS slash merch. If you have feedback for us, well... We have an email address, and that email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. If you can join us live, please do Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2130 UTC, and you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Have a great weekend, everybody. We'll see you Monday. Bye. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>